Yo, 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 yo. What's good with it? It's the homie Mac, man. Uh, reporting live from the Dogon. Each one teach one. Peace and love. Peace and love. Thumbs up. Give me the likes. Thumbs up. Give me the likes. Thumbs up. Give me the likes. Like, share, comment, subscribe. Subscribe to the YouTube channel 82 Kings. Yeah. Um, but let's get straight to it. This is a session of Mac Minutes. Um, this session of Mac Minutes will be entitled White Messiah Complex. Um, if, if you pay attention to a lot of the things that I talk about on this channel, I definitely talk about, uh, justice and, um, social political issues as it resonates with race. Um, I'm coming from a, uh, how do I say it? <laughs> I, I'm coming from a pro-black narrative. But I think globally, um, at the same time, um, and it's not, you know, everything is, so, well, every, all things are political. Shout out to U.P. Newton. That's what he said, all things are political. And that's facts. All things are political. There is a political dynamic to everything. Not voting is a, not voting is a political stance. Uh, wearing your hat a certain way is a political stance. Um, how you dress in a lot of ways is a political stance. Um, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but what am I getting at? Uh, at its core, I want to talk about the spiritual and social ramifications of the white messiah complex. Um, I've always argued that, um, pictures of a white Christ and, you know, we've heard different, uh, you know, some people don't even think Jesus ever existed, but to those that do believe that, uh, you know, God came uh, in the flesh as uh, Jesus. Um, you know, if you're into that type of thing, I am. I'm a Christian. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, the 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 thing is, how Jesus looked matters. Mattered. Matters. How Jesus is perceived culturally, um, socially, it matters. Um, a lot of, you know, every, you know there, there are a lot of people who, are atheists who don't have uh, any reckoning with religion. But irrespective of all that, um, greater society does have an affiliation with religion, uh, especially Christianity. We know that religion has always been a political game. We know that. Religion has always been a political game. Uh, <laughs> I don't necessarily think that was the will of the creator. But, you know, like my dad always says, things are good until you get people involved. Things can get real murky. Um, but, yeah, uh, from a spiritual sense, a white messiah complex has hurt us. And, I re and I'm realizing it's not even just black people. It is all indigenous. You know, this is a revelation I probably had, like, my senior year of college. Um, understanding that imperialism, colonialism, white supremacy, um, these things do not only... Uh, attack the social and spiritual reality of black people, they attack the social and spiritual reality of all non-whites. Be it uh, Native Americans, um, be it uh, Chicano, uh, be it East Indian, be it uh, um, Asian, Southeast Asia, uh, the world over. Um, Christianity has definitely been used as a political arm of white supremacy. We know this. Uh, we know that, uh, I, and, I've, and I've always made this, my contention, I've always said this, um, a white Christ, a white Jesus, is the, is, is, white Jesus, white Jesus is literally the mascot for white supremacy. Um, it's kind of like Dr. John Henry Clark said, RIP Dr. John Henry Clark, he said that the thing about the European is they were able to colonize the image of God. They make God look like them. Uh, and that affects your self-esteem. That affects your self-worth. That affects how you view yourself naturally. Um, and it makes you put whiteness. It makes you center yourself in proximity to, to whiteness. Um, and by that, I'm simply saying that we all think in di dialectical patterns, yin and yang. 
if white is good, pure, pristine, saintly, divine, uh, you see whiteness and you perceive it as such and you get in alignment with it. But when you look in the mirror and you realize you don't look like that, you don't look like Tom Cruise, you don't look like Jesus, Jesus Christos. So you must be the antithesis or the yang to that yin. So if the whiteness is good, if it's pure, pristine, beautiful, magical, beautiful, you know, wisdom, strength, all that, and um, you don't look in the mirror and see that image, you're going to think you're the antithesis to that. So you are weak. You are treacherous. You are inclined, you, you are spiritually inclined uh, to be lesser than. That, 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 that gives you vacant esteem. That, that uh, makes you subconsciously, in a lot of ways, put yourself in a lower rung. Um, and I've always said, all indigenous people, we've been ra we've literally been conditioned to become... We, all indigenous people, um, and we know when you say indigenous, you're basically saying all non-white people, for the most part. And, we, and it's funny, you no, know, it's not funny, it's messed up, because when you say indigenous, it's usually in correlation to land, land that that imperialist colonists conquered. The land that they conquered was that of the indigenous people. Um, but yeah, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but what am I getting at? Ultimately, a lot of indigenous people, a lot of indigenous people have framed their self-worth, their esteem in proximity to whiteness. How many white friends do I have? Um, do white people accept me? How many white people are in my social circle? Again, friends. Um, Am I accepted by white society? And it's, it's just a massive brainwashing. You had the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania where basically, uh, and I think Jim Thorpe actually went to Carlisle. Went to the Carlisle School. But I remember uh, hearing about the Carlisle School. And basically, um, they were trying to, white people at the Carlisle School were basically trying to socialize natives to be white. And I remember reading some of the letters that the native students wrote while they're at the Carlisle School, they were talking about, yeah, um, I, I, don't, I, I really have a deep scorn for, uh, I have a deep disdain and contentment for my native heritage. I wish I were white. And I've always said that white supremacy is the greatest, it is the, it is the most effective and concise psyop ever. Literally the world over has bought into it. Um, they, they use propaganda, they use propaganda, they use religion, they use politics, and they used war to disseminate the, 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 to disseminate the, the idea that uh, white supremacist logic is supreme over everyone. Um, I want to talk about... Uh, A poem called uh, "The White Man's Burden" uh, by Rudyard Kipling. I'm gonna read. And when I first read this in college, I thought this was satire. I thought he was just joking. But come to find out, um, Rudyard Kipling had actually uh, spent time in India, um, British up upbringing, because you know he he wanted you know the British wanted India to be a part of the British Empire. But as the the British Empire started to dissipate. Um, this was like a call to arms. Basically, what your Kipling was saying in the late... He wrote this in like 1899, February of 1899. He basically was saying like, America, you need to carry on the whiteness. Carry on the, the baton. Carry on <laughs> the, 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 the need to civilize these pagan animals, these childlike animals, these non-whites. Pick up where, 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 Europe, where the European powers have left off. America... Fulfill your destiny. I'm going to read some of the lines. I thought this was a satire when I first read it. But no, he was serious. Uh, this poem literally affected politics. I think Theodore Roosevelt actually read this poem and uh, it, it, he, it, it, um, it was the impetus for a lot of foreign policy. That's what, I, that's what I've read. Uh, but let me read it. Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Go send your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild. Your new caught sullen, sullen peoples, half devil and half child. 
Take up the white man's burden and patience to abide, to veil the threat of terror and check the show of pride. Be open by open speech and simple and hundred times made plain to seek another's profit and work another's gain. Take up the white man's burden and reap his old reward. The blame of those ye better, the hate of those ye guard, the cry host ye, ye humor. Ah, slowly to the light. Why brought ye from bondage? I love the Egyptian night. Take up the white man's burden. Have done with childish days. The lightly proffered laurel. The easy, ungrudged praise. Comes now to search your manhood. Through all the thankless years. Cold edged with dear bought wisdom. The judgment of your peers. The white man's burden. By Rudyard Kipling. The irony, I pledge the alpha. We have to... <laughs> When I was pledging Alpha Phi Alpha, we had to learn if by regular Kipling. But yeah, Kipling was an imperialist, colonialist. Um, but yeah, uh, essentially, uh, a lot of people, a lot of indigenous people, we, we have... Well, first of all, let me acknowledge this poem. This poem just pretty much says, again, um, these beastly savages that are half devil and half child, they need us. They need our whiteness to, to solidify them and to... To give them morals and principles and ethics and and um to to give them just a moral obligation to be better because without us as white folks they are savages. Um, again, I'm reading uh, "Black Skin, Black Skin, White Mask" by uh, Franz Fanon, and a lot of what he says in that book is dedicated to to show how imperialism and colonialism has affected um, specifically. Um, the African diaspora, um, and, and, and it's, what's, what's really sad is a lot of the dynamics of white supremacy, um, the lighter complected you are, the closer you feel you are to whiteness, and you'll literally turn on darker complected people. Like I've always said, like the face of power may change, but the politics of white supremacy won't until we attack the root cause of white supremacy. Because you have people who are Latino who will say, well, I'm, I'm not Mexican. I'm not, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not, like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not Latin. I'm Spanish, which speaks to, um, you know, Spanish imperialism. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm you know, my skin is, I'm, I'm light, I'm fair complected to them. And you have basically uh, non-black people, indigenous people cosplaying white supremacy, cosplaying white supremacists. <laughs> you know, so the face of power may change, but the dynamics may not shift until there is a collective moral, spiritual revolution. Um, it'll be the same thing. It'll just be a different face, and, and it, it's just sad that white that white supremacy has has resonated so so strongly, um, where you have indigenous people who will literally uh, forsake their culture, forsake themselves. Um, to be in alignment with white supremacy. It's like uh, Dr. Francis Chris Welsing said, um, true supremacy speaks for itself. But white supremacy has literally been uh, a psyop. It's been a, it's been a global campaign the world over. I said global, world over. Um, to get indigenous people to hate themselves. But it's like the darker you are, the lower you are on this social strata. And it is, again, there are, there are indigenous people. Some of the biggest white supremacists I've ever encountered have been non-white people. So there's just a lot of healing. Um, I think uh, we need to accept ourselves. And, I, and I've always said this. We need to look in the mirror and be honest with ourselves. Ask ourselves. Ask ourselves these tough questions. Why do I think and believe as I do? Dialectically speaking, dialectical patterns. Why do I think such is beautiful and, and the other is ugly. Why do I think beauty looks this way? Why do I think the antithesis of that looks another way? Why do I have certain biases and certain leanings? Why do I feel what I, the way I feel? More of us need to ask ourselves that. Um, but yeah, white messiah complex. Um, like, I've said this a thousand times, Dr. Naeem Akbar, he calls it plantation psychosis. He feels as though we all have, uh, you know, from an epigenetic standpoint, how things were literally beaten to our ancestors to, to worship whiteness. 
uh, those things have been trans have uh, been handed down. You know, I can remember women in my family saying, "Oh, she'd be prettier if she was lighter." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, so let's not act like you know, black men and black women alike that there are things that we need to collectively unlearn. We need to have grace and mercy with one another. And if you know right, like my grandmother said, uh, if you know right, do right. The knowledge is out there. The information is out there. Um, I'm a uh, one of the things I think is really dope. Uh, Karl Marx's theory on dialectical materialism: how society is in a perpetual flux and things evolve. But we have to ask ourselves to do justice to humanity. Why are things the way they are? And how can I make the world a more just place? Mac minutes. Um, some of y'all may be thinking I'm tripping, but most of y'all gonna feel me, and I already know it. Um, look in the mirror. Be honest with yourself. Um, be the best human you can be. Be the best human being you can be. Um, shine light, spread wisdom, justice. Justice over everything. Signing out from the Dogon. It's the homie Mac, man. Like, share, comment, subscribe. Each one, teach one. I'm out. Peace.